So I'd just like to welcome you to the um, scientific uh, webinar series that we're running. This uh, second one that um, has been uh, organized. Um, today, it's going to be um, Aaron Hog Hogkinson, who's going to be talking about um, long-acting inje injectable models. Um, so just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, you might notice as you join, you're muted. Um, if you want to ask a question, there's a chat box. Um, alternatively, you can raise your hand um, during the presentation, and then uh, we'll just take a pause and uh, unmute you if you need to ask for any question or any clarification. And just to let you know that the session is recorded today, and um, previously with the last one we put put that on YouTube so the intention is to do the same again with that one so um, if you just go on to the next slide Aaron I'll just so yeah so Aaron um, uh, did a PhD in mathematical biology in Montpellier um, and um, essentially He's worked in the field of mathematical modeling. Um, in terms of that, he was looking at um, tumor invasion and uh, particularly resistance um, uh, targeted therapies. Um, in terms of um, his uh, career, he's been at um, Satara UK in the Simpson division. Um, but that wasn't enough for him. He's also um, now at a fellowship in the University of Exeter. So um, that's keeping him very busy and uh, keeping his mind engaged. He's um, involved in uh, a number of uh, grants, which are um, part of um, some of the SimSIF work that he's been doing, and is going to be touching on some of that work um, also that he's been doing, um, on the, particularly on the long-acting injectables in this talk. So, Aaron, um, over to you. Looking forward to it. Okay, thanks very much for the introduction, Ollie. Um, yeah, as Ollie said, my background is in mathematics, um, but uh, during my time at Sotara and, and a bit earlier, uh, I worked with some pharmaceutical companies to specialize in pharmaceutical applications of, uh, of higher dimensional modeling. Um, and I, I hope to be able to show you one of the uh, models we've been working on most recently um, today. Uh, so, as Ollie I said, I th uh, said I think um, feel free to ask questions during the um, during the presentation, especially if they're clarification questions, um, just so we can answer them ASAP. Um, yeah. Okay. So, uh, first of all, um, I'd like to tell you just a bit about the increased interest in PLGA-based uh, long-acting injectables and basically why we've been doing this project. Um, so, it's become increasingly common in a number of key therapeutic areas, especially where dose dependence or dose adherence um, is especially important. So, antipsychotic medication and mental health medications where people often miss doses and that can be quite um, traumatic. Uh, oncology, again, where dose adherence is extremely important and endocrinology where hormones need to be regulated over long time periods. Um, Again, I'm sure many of you know this, but uh, just in case there are some people who are here who are less familiar with the formulation, um, it's been used uh, across the spectrum of drug development. So we're seeing a lot of new drug products using this formulation, as well as reformulation of existing products. So um, 505B2 sort of root products and uh, complex generic products are, are uh, being produced in this area as well. Um, and of course, uh, along with that, we've seen a lot of increased interest in both the industry and in academia with trying to employ modeling solutions. First of all, because although these formulations are extremely attractive because they can be given to a, a subject once every three months or six months, for example, um, quite often that means that you have to test the product for three or six months as well, and that can be extremely costly. So people are employing modeling solutions to try and uh, optimize formulation design parameters for a start uh, to try and speed up the 
the uh, rapidity of development, um, and as well as trying to use it for uh, prototype testing. And, and um, it's coming increasingly likely that this will be a, a route of bioequivalence sometime in the, in the future. Um, and the regulators have shown uh, quite an increased interest in alternative approaches to advancing these types of products uh, because they're so challenging um, and take such a, a vast investment. So um, we're quite optimistic about that. So some of the, the basic usage uh, statistics, just for anyone who doesn't know the formulation, the typical dynamics of these formulations are given for between one and six months. So this is a uh, trial star. It's an example of, um, uh, well, there are several different um, trial star products again, but this is uh, a three and one month dosing, as you can see. I'll see if I can get a pointer option here. Yeah, good. So as you can see, these are generally characterized by an initial spike, um, which especially in cases of hormonal regulation tend to dramatically decrease or increase the, the hormone concentrations and then a slow release over a long or extended time period, which regulates the hormonal levels. Um, so this is just an example of the type of uh, PK profiles we see in these types of products. Um, again, they can be administered once, and then they can last up to one, uh, from one to six months, which makes them very, um, very attractive. And as I had said before, dose adherence um, categories tend to be targeted quite um, aggressively, um, and that's including cancer, mental illness, and uh, increasingly we're seeing treatments which are prone to abuse as well. So we know there's a lot of opioid abuse, um, particularly in the West now, and uh, we've seen, therefore, a lot of opioid treatment strategies employed using PLGA products because they're, they're more difficult to abuse. Uh, they release slowly of their own accord, um, so you can't overdose or, or take too many of them at any given time. Um, and this was just a statistic which I found quite um, quite stark and uh, sort of summed up the need for these types of uh, strategies in dose adherence. So in Canadian offenders, uh, particularly schizophrenic offenders, the rates of recidivism in a high treatment category where, where treatment adherence was... Um, below what you would expect. So when people were not adhering to their treatment, in other words, um, the rates of nonviolent and violent crimes increased. Or in other words, when um, high treatment adherence was guaranteed, or when people were taking their treatments, nonviolent and violent crimes were decreased. So this is one example where there's quite an obvious um, advantage and obvious, um, if you like, a good reason for for making sure that people are adhering to their goals uh, on a societal level even. And the uh, pharmaceutical areas, this is just to give you an idea again, so the, the most common is oncology so far, quite a lot of female reproductive indications as well for endometriosis, for example. Um, antipsychotics are another big one, opioid replacement therapy, antibiotics, uh, I was quite surprised to find was a big one, but this is particularly in cases where you've had surgery, they use these uh, post-operatively to stop infections from occurring after surgery. And then, obviously, just as big as the biggest uh, field, oncology, you have several other extremely diverse treatment strategies employed using PLGA therapies as well. So th this is a, 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 well, a more comprehensive list, giving you, and you can see it's anywhere from diabetes to macular degeneration, um, arthritis relief even. So it's quite a diverse set of, uh, of um, treatment indications that we're seeing in these types of formulation or, or types of product. Uh, are there any questions on this section? Okay. Um, so the PLJ formulation background um, so, uh, again, I'm, I'm sure that most of you are aware of what's going on with these formulations and uh, why they behave the way they do, but I just want to give you some indication because it also gives you some idea of how, uh, of what kind of modeling challenges there are for us as a company. So, um, it's a biodegradable polymer, uh, acidic end caps. You can also get asteric end cap polymers, um, although our model is currently parameterized to work with the acidic end cap polymers. Um, 
Yeah, so by changing the lactate to glycolide molar ratio, you can change both the rate of degradation and uh, the, the shape of the curve, if you like, the, the Cmax, the Tmax, um, and uh, the AUC as well. Um, and essentially, the higher the ratio of lactide to glycolide, so typically these are between 100% lactide and 50% lactide, and the higher lactide you have, the slower the degradation is. Um, and increasing the molecular weight of the polymer is yet another way to increase the or, or increase the time over which uh, it degrades or decrease the rate of degradation, if you prefer. And uh, this is actually quite a complex problem because it's not just the mean molecular weight that makes a difference, but also the distribution of molecular weights within the polymer, um, as we'll, we'll come to see. So the challenge is to try and account for all these fundamental chemical uh, interactions whilst all pre also predicting the large-scale dynamics in the human being, uh, or in the, the organism, if you prefer. Um, okay, so just to give you an idea, this is again about the lactide to glycolide ratio. So as you increase from 50% lactide to, this should be, um, this should be 85, 15. Uh, this is not my mistake, this is in the actual uh, published paper. So this is 85% lactide, and what you can see is as you increase the lactide ratio, you're uh, increasing the time over which it degrades, so you're decreasing the rate at which it degrades. Um, so here you've got quite a, a sharp spike in the release rate, and here you've got a much more gradual release of the, the drug over time. Um, likewise, by increasing the solid fraction, you um, increase the disintegration time. So in other words, um, as the, the number of pores in the uh, formulation increases, the, um, the implant degrades slower, uh, or faster, sorry. It, it disintegrates in less time. Now, this study was actually done in microspheres, but the same holds true for implants as well. So the more pores you have in your implant, the faster the liquid essentially can get into the implant and start hydrolyzing the, the bonds in the polymer. And then this was sort of the most challenging case for us, um, I suppose, was that as you change the compound in the implant, you can also change the release dynamics. So not only is there uh, a polymeric hydrolysis interaction here, there's also an interaction with the compound itself. Um, and trying to account for this was relatively challenging, but we've managed to do it by using a, a more um, empirical approach, let's say. So we're still only parameterizing the model using fundamental parameters, but we're using an empirical approach to try and uh, understand these dynamics by using these fundamental parameters. So we're correlating with the fundamental parameters, in other words. Okay, so the modeling strategy uh, in that case, um, we essentially want the, the model to have four major uh, hallmarks, let's say which is that we want it to be predictive, useful, relevant, and logical. So the predictive element just means that we want to build a mechanistic bottom-up modeling approach. And that's so that, first of all, we know that uh, any mistakes that our model is making is because of a mistaken assumption. So if you don't have a bottom-up approach, then you don't necessarily know why your model is making mistakes. But if we know that our assumptions are linked uh, very closely to the mathematical model, then we know that our assumptions need to change if the model is not correct. Um, and we also want to be making, a, uh, as I say, predictions based on the fundamental parameters of the, the system. So we don't want to have to use any outputs as inputs, if you like. So a lot of the modeling strategies um, out there use IVRT data to try and parameterize uh, in situ approaches, but we're not using any kind of temporal experimental data to parameterize our model. Okay, the second thing is we want to make predictions that are useful to the industry. So again, we don't want to have to have data to get data. We want to be able to take the characteristics of an implant and make a, a useful prediction. We want to be using parameters that are available to the industry. Um, so we want the industry to be able to uh, measure things about their implant and then use those characteristics to um, input into our model and get a, a useful prediction. 
and then logical, it has to have a robust derivation. And again, that's just to increase our, uh, both our understanding of the model and also our uh, reliance on the model. So we know we can rely on it better if the derivation is robust. Okay, so again, just to, to recap, the model has been developed using a completely mechanistic frameworks. So we, we don't have to have any um, IVIVE, for example. Um, and all of the dynamical equations are based on the fundamental chemical reaction kinetics. Um, and in order to do this, we've used a combination of probability theory and spatial dynamics. So the degradation of the implant is um, characterized by probability uh, dynamics. And the actual release of the drug and uptake by the body is um, done using spatial dynamics modeling. So we're not using any IVRT data. So um, some of the interactions with the regulator we had were about this as well, where they had assumed we were using IVRT data. But, but one of the very interesting things about our model is although we can make predictions about the IVRT, uh, behavior of the implant, we don't actually need IVRT to parameterize the model. Um, and again, so far, uh, the model is intended uh, for and parameterized specifically for PLGA-based products. So um, although you can use the the plugin that we're we're pitching, if you like, the plugin that we've produced um, over the past year, you can use it for other types of polymers, but you would have to do a lot more work to reparameterize this. Um, but if you want to um, look at a PLGA-based product, then you're ready to go. Um, the model should be relatively robust for these formulations. Um, so the current results that I'm going to show you today have been simulated using an R package, but this is going to be um, implemented precisely in the same way for a SimSip, uh, in a much more user-friendly way, though, of course. And um, we've had several uh, positive um, interactions with the FDA to date, um, and we'll, we're looking forward to seeing how those go as well in the future. So just to show you a lot of the things that we're taking into account in the model, to show you uh, how robustly our um, model is based on the fundamental characteristics of the implant, the compound and physiology, uh, so this is obviously to do with the drug molecule and the human physiology. So in the compound, we're taking into account solubility, hydrodynamic radius, the partitioning of the drug, and the diffusion coefficient in water. Whereas in the physiology, we're taking into account. So um, just to be clear, the first um, instance we parameterized this for was for the subcutaneous space, where we were obviously interested in adipose cell size. But this can also be parameterized, and we have done so for other cell sites, such as intramuscular and even intraocular. Um, so this can be done using the current model. Um, so yeah, we're accounting for adipose cell size, intercapillary distance, and local blood flow. Um, so these would be essential for any body site that you were interested in. Uh, formulation parameters specific to PLGA-based products, uh, the lactide to glycolide molar ratio, solid fraction, size and shape of the implant. Um, just to be clear about the solid fraction, this is sort of a surrogate for porosity. So we know that porosity is one of the CQAs of this type of product. We're taking that into account indirectly through solid fraction, um, although we, we may take a different approach in future, uh, although this seems to work quite well uh, for now. Um, as for the polymer itself, we're using the molecular weight distribution. So again, not just the mean, but the distribution uh, over um, the molecular weight here. So the standard deviation, if you like, and we can also take into account biophasic profiles, which tends to be useful in some, especially some of the more modern cases. The rate of hydrolysis is a fundamental parameter, of course, as well as the rate of autocatalysis and the delay to autocatalysis. So a lot of these uh, profiles you see are biphasic. You get an initial spike, and then you get a secondary spike. And we characterize this as a delay to autocatalysis which you can either use error predictor for, or um, you can reparameterize it yourself if you have um, superior data. Um, and we also tried to take into account this polymer compound interaction, uh, which was quite complex, but um, as far as the user is concerned, all you need is the drug solubility, and we will calculate this uh, interaction term for you. 
So um, in terms of the actual model itself, the form of the model, if you like, we have five fundamental compartments. So we have the trapped intra-implant compartment and the free intra-implant compartment. So these two compartments, if you like, make up the implant. Then you have the interstitial space, which is um, immediately outside the implant, and we assume to be permeated by interstitial fluid. Adipose cell compartment is immediately outside this, and the systemic compartment is accessible by the interstitial space also. Um, and I'll show you this in a, a topological form as well, so or topographical rather, so you can have a look. And the parameters should be well defined and obtainable, as we've said already. Um, so this is basically what the model looks like in a schematic form. Um, and we use a combined diffusion and erosion-based model to account for all the dynamics. So while we have uh, degradation of the implant itself, we have diffusion of the drug out of the implant in through the cells and into the systemic compartment. So um, it's basically just to say that some of these models in the literature are either diffusion or erosion-based, whereas we combine the two because it seems that each are rate-limiting in their own right. Um, and so our model is essentially a multi-scale model of the, of the polymer breakdown, since we're using a micro-scale model um, for the polymer breakdown itself and a macro-scale for the tissue and body scale dynamics. So, and in the polymer breakdown, we're actually going all the way from polymer to oligomer to monomer. I think I have a slide to display this in case it's, it's not clear for now. So, uh, yeah, and as I've said before, we're capable of reparameterizing this for several diverse physiologies. So that's very interesting. Um, and I think Santosh even did a case study where he reparameterized this for dog physiology as well. So it can be done for um, animal models as well. Okay, so just to give you a clear indication of what the model is actually doing, Inside the polymer, uh, or inside the implant rather, what you have is a degradation of the polymer from polymer to oligomer and then to monomer, where the monomers we assume are free to diffuse away as acid uh, species. So during this degradation process, we take into account the mean molecular weight, the molecular weight distribution of the polymer, the PLGA hydrolysis rates and the autocatalysis uh, parameters. So this is very highly parameterized, but all of these parameters are accessible at either a fundamental or uh, experimental level. And this process also takes into account the water occupancy of the implant at any given time. Okay, the second process that we take into account is the water influx itself. So this obviously account or, or gives rise to the water occupancy. Um, and so during this process, what we account for is the lactate to glycolide molar ratio. So this actually affects the um, hydrophilicity of the implant, or hydrophobicity if you prefer. And so as we change this molar ratio, we account for how this affects the influx of water to the implant. The solid fraction also uh, makes a difference to this, um, to this process, as well as the monomer hydrodynamic radius. So this is actually the hydrodynamic radius of the polymer itself, um, which again will be polymer specific, but we parameterize this for PLGA. Um, and obviously the polymer distribution will change this as well. Uh, so the, the, um, just for your information, the objects in blue are actually dynamic variables rather than parameters. Uh, so that's why they're in blue. The third process is then diffusion or obstructed diffusion. So in here we account for the implant size and shape, the monomer hydrodynamic radius and the drug molecule diffusion coefficient, um, and the polymer distribution and water occupancy are also affecting this in the meantime. So obviously the higher water occupancy you have, the faster you can diffuse, and uh, the opposite for polymer distribution. So as you have more polymer, the more obstruction you have. Um, so you, as you can see, the, the spatial model is also quite uh, sophisticated here. Outside the implant, you have diffusive partitioning and systemic uptake. In the diffusive partitioning, we're taking into account the adipose cell size, um, obviously with the drug having to um, diffuse into the adipose cell, uh, or adipocyte if you prefer. Uh, the drug molecule diffusion coefficient and the octanol water partitioning. So this is really where the partitioning comes into the model. 
is partitioning into the cells or out of the cells if you prefer. And likewise with the systemic uptake, we take into account the drug molecule molecular weight and the local blood flow. Um, and the systemic clearance is obviously taken into account in the systemic compartment here. So not directly during the systemic uptake per se, but um, as a systemic uh, process. Um, so that's basically how the model is working. Um, yes, so we essentially have three different types of formulation using PLGA. Um, these are solid implant, in-situ gel forming implants and microsphere depot implant, which I'm sure you're all, all familiar with again. I just want to give you an idea of the progress we've made on these as a company. Um, so in the solid implant, or in all of the implants, rather, we have a well-characterized human physiology. The human physiology doesn't change between these implants. So in the solid implant, we have fully automated prediction. There's no fitting necessary. In the in-situ gel forming implant, because of the interaction between the excipient and the polymer, there's sometimes um, a prediction needed for the demol or the, the release, immediately releasable fraction of the drug. Uh, we can go into more details of that. Um, of particular interest. Uh, but this essentially um, affects the initial spike, the initial uh, Cmax, essentially. All of these are to be implemented in V20. And the solid implant has been extensively verified, as well as the in-situ gel forming implant. The only one that we haven't done much uh, verification on yet, because we had a focus on these other two, not because it's beyond the scope of the project, is um, the Microsphere Depot. Uh, this has some preliminary and indirect verification performed, but we are planning to do a more extensive verification project on this in the near future. Okay, so some simulation results. I know that time is getting on, so I'll go through these uh, relatively quickly, but I think you'll have access to them after the presentation anyway. Uh, I think these will be distributed. So if you're interested, um, uh, well, and the, the talk is going on YouTube as well, so you'll be able to see them again if they're of particular interest to you. So Pacrolimus was a particularly interesting case, not necessarily because of the drug, although the drug is obviously interesting as well, but because this particular case study was done in a rabbit eye uh, physiology. So we had to re-parameterize the physiology for this solid implant in order to simulate the uh, results. Um, so again, I'm not going to go through all these parameters, but they're there if you're interested. Um, and they were all taken from the literature. Uh, so, actually, what we've done in this particular study is we're looking at the concentration of acrylimus within the rabbit eye itself, uh, not within the systemic compartment, because systemic concentrations were below LLQ. Um, and as you can see, we make a very strong prediction on these, uh, on almost every point, in fact, every point, if you like. Um, Unfortunately, and this was strange to us, they didn't take any early enough time points for us to verify the CMAX, um, which is strange because, as I say, we're all aware that these uh, types of implants do have a, a relatively serious um, initial spike in general. So we were unable to verify that uh, because of the lack of data, but the rest of the data is very well fit. Um, so we have relatively high confidence in, in the model there. Uh, Luprolide is obviously an FDA-approved uh, um, product. Uh, um, and as you can see here is, is the Eligard. So the Eligard actually has um, three different uh, dosage attached to it. So this is the 7.5 milligram implant. As you can see, it's a 50-50 lactate to glycide molar ratio. They're, they often change, and the polymers change with every one as well. Sometimes the polymers are made available in the NDA. Sometimes you have to search a bit harder to find them. But they have all been found in the cases that I've looked at anyway. As you can see, almost every point is predicted very well. Uh, Eligard, I should say, is an in-situ gel forming implant. All of the time points are predicted relatively well. The AUC is well within 0 0.5 to 2 fold um, expectation. CMAX is predicted very well. 
the only um, error we seem to be having is somewhere near the start. The, there's something strange about the dynamics of in situ gel forming implants, which means we sometimes um, underpredict after the initial burst release. Um, and we are looking into that well, more out of scientific curiosity than anything else. Uh, but again, the prediction is relatively strong otherwise. Uh, even the secondary spike is quite well predicted in terms of CMAX, if not TMAX. Uh, the 22.5 milligram product is 75-25 lactate to glycoid molar ratio, uh, slightly lower molecular weight. Now, and as you can see again, we've slightly underpredicted after the initial CMAX, but a relatively strong prediction overall. Um, and again, we're using only fundamental parameters here, so we're not actually having to do any fitting in order to get these results, uh, which, which was even quite surprising to us. So uh, the 30 milligram product, again, 75 to 25 lactate to glycolide molar ratio, same polymer molecular weight, so it's literally just an increase in uh, dosage. And so unsurprisingly, we're predicting very well again. Uh, in fact, all of the AUCs are within the 0 0.5 to 2 fold um, error uh, allowance. So uh, all of these predictions are, are within that uh, um, industry standard, if you like. Um, and the last Eligard product, the 45 milligram product, again, is 75 to 25 molar ratio on the same molecular weight again. Um, and an even better prediction in this case, uh, as it turns out. Again, in the in-situ gel forming implants, just um, just for scientific discussion's sake, um, we quite often see even tertiary and um, uh, further burst in these types of formulations. So it's really interesting to us to know why that's occurring, um, but it's something that we're looking into. Otherwise, though, the prediction is very good again. Ah, I thought I had more results than that in this presentation. Yeah, I do. Oh, they seem to all be hidden. Anyway, you'll be given these results uh, if you're interested to see them. They seem to have been skipped in this presentation. I can show you we've also simulated for buprenorphine. Um, so that's the sublocated products. And here we've got the exact same product, but just with differing molecular weights. So you can see how our model is behaving with different molecular weights. It's almost a case study in sensitivity analysis, in fact. Uh, but again, we have very good predictions for each of these. AUCs are qualitative, uh, well, even quantitatively different, but we're predicting those differences quite well. Um, again, this is this time the same molecular weight, but differing doses. Um, and you can see again that our predictions are, are quite strong here. Um, and this is the same thing, but over a different time scale. So this is the, the time scale of the first 25 days. And then you have over 140 days or 150 days, if you prefer. And uh, you can see, again, the predictions are good over the long time scale as well as the short. Um, uh, and this is just a standard, this is the actual sublocate product. So obviously there is actually only one sublocate product, but these were in the NDA anyway, as, as almost case studies or examples or, um, yeah, to, to show the regulator that they've done their, their homework. Like. So um, risperidone, we've also done simulations for. Risperidone was an interesting NDA because we have this sort of confirmation that particle size is not really making a difference in these formulations. So that was interesting to us because in the initial iterations of this model, we were also taking into account the size of the drug molecule particles inside the implant. But what we found was that the, de the time scale of degradation of the particles of drug was actually so much faster than the degradation of the implant itself that it wasn't making a big difference to the release profile. And so what we get in this NDA is actually... Um, uh, a demonstration of this principle. So they've got one um, one implant with low particle size, one with high particle size, and what you can see is there's no significant difference in the results. 
Um, so again, simulations for Parasaurus are, are quite successful. In this case, we've actually done a trial simulation, uh, which is why you've got this 95th and 5th percentile as well. Um, and even the 95th and 5th percentiles are, are relatively close to what we would expect from the uh, clinical trial results. This is Parasaurus 90 milligram. Again, uh, so we've got different lactate glycoid molar ratio, different molecular weight, but we're still predicting this relatively well. Again, we're mispredicting just after the initial CMAX, um, but not to any great extent, to a much lesser extent in this implant, in fact, and we're still within this uh, 0 0.5 to twofold um, error uh, allowance for the AUC. And then the 120 milligram product, same lactate to glycoid molar ratio, um, slightly different molecular weight, uh, but again, a, a relatively strong prediction, uh, I think you would agree. Um, and then, of course, luprolide. So I'm just going to skip back over that. Sorry about that detour there. Um, okay. So the, uh, in some ways, the part we've all been waiting for, the SimSip implementation. Um, we've started to see some early prototypes now within SimSip, uh, and we're still optimistic that it will be implemented in the V20 timeline. Um, but of course, the implementation of this module will be as an additional plugin to SimSip, uh, not within the SimSip core per se. Um, so yeah, as I say, it's, it's going to be available as an additional plugin. I'm just going to get my pointer back. Um, and all the additional plugins are going to be displayed on the home screen. Uh, it may not look exactly like this, but, but we are going to make sure the plugins are displayed on the home screen. And that has sort of a dual function. Uh, first of all, to know what your SimSip is running. And second of all, to know that your plugin is actually active. Uh, so you'll know that your MechPim plugin is is active because it will show on the home screen. Uh, so there should be no ambiguity there. Um, so on the trial design screen, uh, there's going to be a new dosing option available, which will be long acting injectable, and this will allow you to access the plugin in the in the usual way. So SimSip will look exactly the same. It's just that you'll have this additional dosing option. Um, which we think is quite uh, neat. And then the dosing tab, so this is uh, a dosing pop-up rather, this is a bit like the dermal uh, pop-up where you'll get uh, an option of injection site. Uh, we will parameterize some of these um, with the local cell radius and intercapillary distances. Um, this is just for your ease, uh, but you will also have the option to, to parameterize a custom site if you like, and uh, you can do as you wish with these. So this this was the type of option we used for the rabbit intravitreous humor, for example. Um, the, the custom site, just just to be clear, it was the custom site that, that we would have used for that. Um, okay, on the absorption screen, um, so the same way that you would normally access absorption parameters in SimSip with substrate, uh, you're going to have um, all these options which are related specifically to the PLGA-based products. So the po polymer parameters here, um, we have the polylactic coglycolide acid end cap polymer here um, as the default, and that's because that's the one that we parameterized most heavily uh, so far. But the hope is that in future issues of this um, NECPIM plugin, you'll have additional polymer options. So that might be a steric end cap to begin with, and then we might look at other polymers as well, depending on the demand and interest in other polymer options. So again, a PLJ is a sort of uh, bipolymer. So you've got the molecular weight for each um, and other uh, parameters for each. The uh, implant as a whole can then be parameterized. So you've got in situ gel forming uh, implant option here, so you can just switch that on and that will switch you to an in-situ gel forming uh, option. And the main difference in the in-situ gel forming implant from a mathematical point of view is just the initial conditions. So you will see a quantitatively different result, um, but in terms of the inputs you won't have to 
to make much of a change at all. Um, in future issues, uh, we'll try and take into account um, excipient dynamics as well, I suspect. So that may be a slight difference. You also have this view distribution option. So when you put in your molecular weight distributions, you can obviously have uh, bimodal distributions. And this view distribution option will allow you to view your distribution. So this is obviously just an example of a unimodal distribution. Uh, it's actually completely arbitrary. Um, it's not supposed to mean anything in particular. It's just a, an example of what it's going to look like. Um, OK. So the current status is that the V20 plugin should be able to do PLGA-based formulations, and that's all three types, solid implants, in-situ gel forming, and microspheres. The current research of the group is focusing on expansions to a verified microsphere simulator in the first instance. And we're also particularly interested in simulation of intramuscular injectables um, or, or similar types of injectables in other parts of the body. Uh, so these can be solutions, emulsion, suspensions, but injected specifically into the deep tissue. Um, uh, and obviously there are complexities there with, for example, misinjection um, and so on. Uh, so I, again, I'm happy to talk about that. Uh, the theoretical work has been completed there, but uh, the implementation likely won't be on the same timeline as V20. The other interesting addition that we're going to make to the simulator is the new IVRT simulator. So um, parameter estimation and sensitivity analysis will be enabled both for the in-situ uh, implants and the IVRT simulator. And so this could potentially in the future be used for fitting for desired release uh, or pharmacokinetic profiles. Uh, and that's obviously very interesting when you want to look at the design of um, formulations uh, and different design parameters, for example. So this is going to be available, uh, as I say, within the next few months. Uh, so that's quite exciting. Um, and this will allow you to parameterize both the experiment as well as the implant itself. So the implant will be parameterized in a very similar way. The experiment, um, all you've got is the dosing and um, uh, the duration of the experiment and the sampling regimen. So how often you want to take samples from your um, in vitro experiment. Okay. The FISCAM is the same as always. Uh, it's for the drug molecule. The release is going to look very similar to the absorption page that I just showed you. Um, the only difference is you're not going to have any of the physiology-related parameters here, like uh, diffusion co uh, or partition coefficient from um, lipid to water, for example, because there's no need for it in this case. And then your outputs are going to be relatively standard. You're going to be able to overlay different IVRT results as well. We've made sure of that. Um, and you'll also be able to pick whether you want percentage outputs or milligram outputs. So uh, quantities or percentages uh, to increase the, the sort of um, flexibility there. So in conclusion, uh, all the predictions of the CMAX and A you see that I showed you are within the two-fold error of margin. Um, and we only had to use the well-defined characteristics of the formulation in order to predict these, which is, is very interesting for us, uh, and I hope will be for you too. Um, so what we also found during this, um, it was almost a, a scientific experiment for us, was that accounting for the CQAs in a very fundamental way made a huge difference. Um, and it really allowed us to, to make some startling predictions on the behavior of these complex formulations. Um, as I said before, the model is able to account for various formulations and physiologies. So this, again, is a, a big bonus. And um, we've submitted a manuscript for, pub for uh, publication as well. Um, and the hope is to submit some further publications in the near future. As, um, as you've seen, we've, we've verified on a number of different uh, products. So the hope is to try and publish these. Um, implementation coming as a plugin for SimSit V20. And uh, the, the really interesting part of this is because we only rely on fundamental parameters, the hope is that this will be an important component of the SimSIP formulation workbench, uh, which is we're hoping to, to build over the next few years. Um, and the idea is that you'll be able to 
of a hypothetical um, release profile that you would like to achieve and that you'll be able to use this formulation workbench to try and work back to the design parameters. So with that, um, I'd just like to ask if there are any questions. Uh, thanks, Eric. Just trying to see if there's anyone with their hand up. Uh, you can use that. Or you can use the chat. Just uh, while we're waiting, Aaron. So, so at the start, you mentioned about yeah, you know, um, the, the types of use. So is this mainly um, repurposing or, or reformulation of um, older drugs, or is this being used for uh, newer drugs as well? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, as I mentioned on the first slide, we're really seeing a big mix of of all three types of development. So you are seeing a lot of new drugs, especially in these, well, I mean, I don't know if you can say new per se uh, in the opioid um, replacement, for example, because these are obviously opioids that have been used before, but it's obviously quite a new application of the, the drug um, in this type of formulation. Uh, you are seeing new drugs, especially though in post-operative um, applications. So, for example, I know there's a, a product called Propel, which is used for post-sinus surgery to stop inflammation. So this is a completely new drug, uh, but you're correct that a lot of them are sort of existing uh, drug molecules which we know are uh, particularly uh, efficacious, let's say, um, which are being put into these formulations in order to extend their life. Thanks. And in terms of the, the interaction with the regulators, um, uh, what's their kind of perspective on the modeling side of things? Yeah, um, well, I'm, I'm sure you've interacted with the regulators before, so they don't really like to say <laughs> very clearly. Um, but all we can say is that they've been uh, really without any particular need to, they've been engaging with us very heavily on this model. Um, so obviously we don't have a grant for this model, um, but simply through the development process, they've been interacting with us quite heavily and they've taken a keen interest in, in this approach. I think this is because they do have several grants open on this, um, but our model is the only one um, as far as I'm aware, that actually uses a fully mechanistic basis for making this prediction. So a lot of the regulators or the uh, models that have been produced using the regulators' grants are using, for example, IVIVE or IVRT results to power their model. But ours is the only uh, mechanistic one that I found available that's actually parameterizable. So I've also seen some very obscure mathematical ones, which are fully mechanistic, but that you could never parameterize. <laughs> Um, so th I think that's why they've taken such a keen interest. Okay, thanks. Um, someone's asked on the chat how our release profiles loaded for the long-acting injectables. Um, you mean how are they simulated? Or how are they input? Or... I understand the question. I've unmuted um, Taicho. Okay. It might be easier for Taiko to uh, ask the question directly. Yep. Y yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, yes. Uh, very exciting and timely uh, module that you're describing there. I guess uh, one, one question I was curious about is... Um, so how, how exactly does this release profile uh, get integrated with the IVIVC module? Or does it? Ah, um, it? Well, it doesn't in this case. So um, 
as I was uh, sort of trying to explain, is that the IVRT, or the release profile, let's say, is completely separate from the in-situ um, in uh, modeling. So the simulation of the in-situ formulation, you could, for example, use an IVRT uh, result that you have to back calculate the parameters. So for example, if we go to the release parameters, you could back calculate uh, a formulation that does release in the same way and use that to simulate an in situ experiment. But we're not using any sort of IVIVC or IVIVE in this module. So we don't actually need any release profile in order to make predictions. Yeah, the reason I'm asking is because for long acting injectables, right, you may have PK data that it, they go out to a year, but your release profile may not go quite out to a year, maybe only to six months. So in, in that case, you would typically use a in vitro in vivo correlation. And what I'm hearing you say is this is not directly integrated. Is yeah, that that's right. We, we haven't yet integrated any options for in vitro and vivo correlation. Are you talking about maybe using like accelerated release, for example, profiles to, to correlate? Uh, yes, I am actually talking about solid implants where you have PK that are collected over many, many months. And then you have some type of in vitro profile. And you're trying to predict, uh, you're trying to link the in vitro profile to a in vivo release. And you will be using your LI module here to, to load the in vitro release profile. Yeah, so uh, you're correct that there is no option to do that uh, as it stands. Um, so the idea in this case, uh, what I would suggest, because really all we need is the fundamental parameters of the polymer. Um, and we should be able to make the prediction. So there should be no need to actually even generate in vitro results um, in order to get an in vivo prediction. If you do want to use the um, in vivo results, what I would suggest is taking the fundamental parameters of your system, uh, loading in the experimental results and using the fitting, so the parameter estimation to um, estimate your some of your release uh, features. So you could use this, for example, to predict the autocatalytic auto delay or the hydrophobicity of your product. Mm -hmm. And that way, um, you would be able to correlate in that way. So this would be a type of testing correlation, if you like. But there's no way to directly correlate, no. I see. And uh, do I still have one question? Yeah, I think if no one else is waiting, you can go ahead, yeah. Uh, typically, formulations are evaluated also using animal data, so either most likely dog or yeah. some type of rat. How, how would, how would uh, some scientist use the new module together with the SimSIV animal module? Yeah, so... Um... Uh, this is maybe a weird suggestion. So we're not actually going to be implementing it directly into the animal simulator, at least this year. Uh, I don't know if it's something that we'll look at in future, but as you say, it's quite common that this would be done, especially in the cases of long acting injectables because they're so expensive to run clinical trials. So I imagine it will. Um, we will try and do it in the future. What I would suggest doing um, is, as I say, using the, if I can skip back to the physiology here, the physiology is parameterized relatively generally. So what I would suggest mm -hmm. is using the custom physiology site, and then you would have to sort of re-parameterize the human simulator or the animal model. So the physchem and release would obviously be the same. Mm -hmm. What you'd be changing is like the clearance rate, you would have to use an animal, uh, um, an animal clearance value and you might have to change some of the other physiology. Like uh, You may have to change the VSS as well, of course. Um, that's what I would suggest, at least in the first instance, if you wanted to simulate animal experiments. Yes. We have managed to do it for, as I say, rabbit eye. Um, so that was quite an interesting case. 
And as I say, Santosh also did it for a dog experiment with buprenorphine. Um, <laughs> uh, sorry, it wasn't buprenorphine, it was bisarolin. Um So it can be done, uh, but obviously it's a little bit cumbersome in the first instance. Yeah, thank you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, there was going to be another question, but I think you've answered it actually in uh, in that last session there. So, don't think there's any other questions right now. Obviously, um, there's quite a bit of discussion there, and um, you can contact Aaron directly. Um, have you provided your email address on the slides? Um, at least in the one that you will send out, we'll make sure that your email address is, is in there so you can yeah. be contacted for any questions. Yeah, it's not um, on the screen, but I'll make sure I do put it on. Okay, thanks for that. Um, if you could just move on to the, the last slide. Thanks again, um, Aaron. Um, just a date for your diary, just to let you know about the, the next talk in this a webinar series. Um, Khalid, I'm sure a lot of you know at SimSIP, will be looking at predicting drug uh, PK in uh, pregnancy, fetal, and lactation using PBPK. So that's on November the 10th, and um, it will be the same time as this. And in that talk, is going to be looking at time varying models, looking at physiological changes impacting PK. And that covers the entire gestational life cycle, um, as well as uh, mother and baby. In terms of um, some of the work, he'll look at some case studies. Um, and another important um, part of the project, and it's often generates a lot of interest, is um, looking at prediction of milk drug exposure as well. So please, um, Join us um, for that one in November. Just as a reminder, the slides from today's uh, session will be made available. And um, also, we'll be um, looking to put this up on YouTube. So we'll hopefully send out a link um, when that's available. Thanks for joining us, and uh, take care. Thank you very much, everyone.